Today's guest is everything from a Grammy-nominated artist to a financial literacy guru. I'm Rosemarie Miller here with Ryan Leslie, who will talk all about the music industry and how to manage our money. Thank you so much for joining me today, Ryan. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So we are all trying to make some money, save some money, make mm -hmm. our money, make some money. Mm -hmm. And you have a wealth plan, which is what, a financial literacy club? Yes. What, what gave you the idea to create It's this? a club, you know. I feel as though really when we grow up, we are taught almost culturally that finances are, and there's actually a moniker for it, personal finance, right? Mm -hmm. And so we're caught, we're, we are caught in between, should we share what's happening with our finances? Should we keep it a secret? I know for me growing up, it was, hey, you don't talk about how much you make, you don't talk about uh, how much you have invested, how much you have saved. Mm -hmm. What I found though is that when you can make the journey, a collective journey, the pathway to let's call it understanding of what's actually happening, the ability to have a sounding board where you have a community of folks that are concerned and have some care and consideration for your financial well-being, this can really make a massive difference in the uh, achievement of, let's call it exponential compounding. Mm -hmm. So that's really what uh, the premise of Wealth Plan was all about, is the fact that I, when I decided I wanted to learn finances, I wanted to not rent a Bruce Lee movie and teach myself karate, I wanted to learn directly from yeah. someone who actually did it the right way. And so Wealth Plan is exactly that. It allows me to, based on what I've been able to achieve, now be able to give back in a way that allows me to be a one-on-one -on -one mentor and hopefully make an impact that's not just gonna be for the person I'm mentoring, but for a family, for a generation as well. So speaking of generations, mm -hmm. how can someone who, you know, ain't got no generational wealth, mm -hmm. how can they get to that point? Yeah. To get to generational wealth, so much has been said about it, right? It's such a simple concept. It's, a, it's the eighth wonder of the world. It is compounding. Okay. And you mm -hmm. can start, it's really just about starting. So uh, listen, when you think about compounding, you think about it over time, the wealthiest investors, or maybe the most well-known wealthiest investors, the ones that are on the Forbes list, mm -hmm. the ones that have done it in the financial markets, those investors are those who started small and just consistently compounded over time. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that there are so many, let's call it, apprehensions when it comes to the stock market. It can be a very sort of, uh, uh, it, can, it can be a very sort of opaque scary place to yes. be, right? Mm -hmm. And when we look at statistics, when we're able to actually remove the human tendencies that will make an investor lose money, when we're able to remove those human tendencies from our decision making, we're actually able to have smooth sailing when it comes to compounding. So what does that mean? That means that we should be able to drive our decision making with data and statistics. The best data around a company that you want to own is just the fundamental data of how the business is actually performing. And the beauty of the public markets in the United States of America is that every three months you can get a very, very clear earnings report from every single company that's publicly traded. And if you want to actually, let's call it, reduce your uh, risk and volatility, you can just invest in an index. And the S&P 500, we hear it talked about all the time, but the reason we hear about it all the time is because when you look at the historical statistical data of being invested in the S&P, a time horizon of 20 years or more means that you have a 0% chance of loss. So if you can take losses out of investing in the stock market, mm -hmm. how much more at ease can we be when taking our first steps. And so when we think about generational wealth, and that's the question you're asking, it's about getting started as early as possible. And that means that even if you're starting later, let's say you're starting in 30s, 40s, 50s, you know someone in your family, could be a son, daughter, a niece or nephew, that once you've acquired this knowledge, each one teach one. And it's the ability to actually show how your money is working 
for you to those who are coming up after you. And once they can, let's call it uh, develop, but not just develop, but master a sense of how to actually navigate the financial markets, you find that starting earlier delivers exponential results over time when it comes to compounding. And what's compounding? It's just incremental gains, 100,000 or even 10,000 or 1,000 that grows by 10%. Mm -hmm. That percentage is equal for everyone across the board. So if you stay invested for a year, you got $1,000 and you get a 10% return, you're going to make $100 on that 1,000. So Learning, what, yeah, yeah, go ahead. What, what would you tell someone who, I don't know, they 70 years old, they're mm -hmm. doing this, they got all that time. Yes. What, what would you tell that person? So you're saying someone who's starting much, much later. Much later. Right. Yeah. Really, the, there really is no difference to the strategy, right? Okay. Because obviously starting at 70 is much later than, let's say, someone learning at 24 or 25, right? right? The vehicles into which you can invest remain the same. So the S&P 500 has been around for 70 years. You have to get started. They say the best time to start investing was 20 years ago. The next best time <laughs> is today. Okay, so eliminating losses, if there's a way to do that, mm -hmm. why isn't everybody doing it? I would say, you know, amongst the folks that are, that are, that are actually a part of, of my Wealth Plan Club, mm -hmm. really the reasons that I hear for folks who haven't done it is because they were never introduced to this concept. And even though the concepts are very, very simple, they require no more than middle school math to understand, if we look at our educational journey, from the time we're in middle school to when we get to high school to when we get to college, most of our education and training is really focused on making us dependent on the capitalist system in which we live. Mm -hmm. Living paycheck to paycheck, deciding that we want to go out and actually, you know, go take on a large amount of debt, which is collateralized by a home, the American dream. The difference, though, is when you look at stories of folks that have really made it, and I'm talking about multi-billionaire status, they got started very early and they got started in a different way. And what they did was actual real ownership without having to leverage debt to acquire the ownership. What does that mean? If you've got $100,000, you can actually put $100,000 down on, let's say, a $400,000 house, right? You're actually taking on $300,000 in debt. On the flip side, if you have 100000 and you invest it, let's say, in Apple, and this isn't financial advice, but yes. if you were to invest that 100000 in Apple, the difference there is based on the actual brokerage system that we have in the United States, not only do you actually own outright the piece of the business that you bought when you spent 100000 on Apple, the brokerage system will actually allow you to be your own bank, which means that if you've got 100000 in Apple, because it's been such a well-performing company, mm -hmm. the brokerage will actually allow you to borrow against that asset, and it's collateralized by the asset. So in some cases, I've worked with folks who have got 100000 in Apple, but they might need you know, 70000 to start a business. Well, they're able to actually leverage 50000 of that 100000 start the business, and pay themselves back. All the while, they never had to sell any of their Apple stock. So while they spent a year, two years, three years developing that business, growing that $50,000 investment, hopefully into a quarter million, Apple stock that they own for that 100000 is working in the background over those three years as well. And if we look at just what's happened this year in Apple stock, it has actually achieved new all-time highs. And that is really the byproduct of excellent leadership, excellent product, excellent services, you find that those businesses, productive assets that we own, they are going to outperform over time. So in your opinion, what's one thing that sets a good investor from a great investor apart? Yeah, so a good investor from a great investor. I know there's so much uh, that's been written about this, mm -hmm. but I would say that it's really just about automating and removing emotion from your investment decisions. Mm -hmm. I would say that really there are three human tendencies that I come across uh, in working uh, with the folks that, that come to join our, our Wealth Plan Club. And that's 
fear, greed, and ego, all right? So fear, very, very simple. There's two sides of the coin. Fear of missing out. Oh my goodness, I see, and let's go back to Apple stock. It's at all time highs. Oh my gosh, I need to buy, 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 buy right now. And there is, let's call it a, uh, a disconnect about how the stock market works. When a company is running up, 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 it doesn't mean that it's always just gonna be a straight line up. There will be times where investors may take some profits off of the table. So fear of missing out may cause an investor to overpay for an investment, right? Because they're chasing, right? A concept or an idea, yeah. but also fear of losing money. So maybe because of their fear of missing out, they might buy uh, a company at 300 or 400 a share, and that company might come all the way down to 250 or 225. And that fear of losing money will cause them to sell as opposed to actually allowing the company the time to actually grow and develop as a great investment. So fear, mm -hmm. greed, which kind of drives the American capitalist system in general. And so our desire to retire earlier, to uh, make more money faster, that sort of feeds into this uh, frenzy in some cases that we may find in the markets. Mm -hmm. And then also ego. There are a number of folks who may all of a sudden say, well, I've watched all the YouTube videos. I've looked at all of the uh, interviews that Rosemary's ever done. I've read all the books and I know, I just know where the market is gonna go. And as Warren Buffett has said so aptly, the markets can remain irrational longer than most investors or really any investor can remain solvent. So even if you do actually know and you feel like you know and you're like, there's no way that this company can keep going down and down and down and down. I'm just gonna keep buying, I'm just gonna keep holding on. What Warren is really saying is that the markets can remain irrational longer than you can continue to buy into that investment. So really, for investors that are just getting started, my recommendation, and you know, I, once again, not financial advice, but what I've seen work very, very well over you know, decades and decades is just creating an automated way out of every paycheck or anytime you get paid to actually own as much of the American financial ecosystem as possible. And if you don't have an idea of what exact companies to pick, just buy a basket of 500 great companies like the S&P, or buy a basket of, of the top 100 uh, technology companies. If you feel like, hey, technology is transforming the way that we live and interact, we can buy the NASDAQ 100. It's not very, very expensive, and you can do so by just automating it. The beauty of index funds is that they actually are, uh, uh, they're set up in such a way that you don't have to do the buying and selling. So when a company is no longer worthy of being in the S&P, mm -hmm. the index will automatically rebalance. It will allow a different company to come in so that you're always really in the best investments, the best vehicles for your capital. So I'm curious, mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on cryptocurrency? My thoughts on cryptocurrency, well, I've had an incredible journey with crypto. Um, yeah. If you check my Twitter all the way back, I would say 2013, I said, pay me in Bitcoin. So all the way back, we're talking 10 years ago now. Yeah. And uh, there was a time where all of my royalties, all of my, uh, all of my revenue, I was making sure that people were actually paying me in Bitcoin all the way back then. So when I was earning the bulk of my revenue in Bitcoin, it was really trading at about $125 a coin. Mm -hmm. Fast forward to now, it's about $30,000 a right. coin for, as of today. And so I've had an incredible journey there, but I've mostly stayed invested in the flagship cryptocurrency, which is Bitcoin. So do you ever suggest cryptocurrency to any of your clients? Well, I actually never suggest an investment. Mm -hmm. What I mostly do is just teach them about all of the different vehicles. And we're talking about even complex uh, derivatives in some cases, how to buy and sell promises in the stock market to, to earn more on your capital. I just want to make sure that I educate and really just provide a, a framework, a, a, let's call it a, a framework through which they can view their investing journey. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned you wanted to be paid in Bitcoin for mm -hmm. your royalties. Yes. So I'm not sure if you saw, but Snoop Dogg mm -hmm. recently had a big issue mm -hmm. with the streaming mm -hmm. industry for mm -hmm. musicians. Right. So could you talk about that? I want to know, like, how are artists getting paid with streaming? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty simple. You can, you can really just 
do a Google search and say, how much do I get per stream? And it's gonna tell you it's about maybe uh, 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 0 .005 mm -hmm. cents, if we wanna call it. So, so, so point, like better? a half a penny or so uh, on every single stream. So when you think about how streaming is actually working, where you, know, you can release a song and get millions and millions of streams, you just multiply that, those millions of streams by that percentage of a penny that you get for every stream. Now, the bottom line is that the music industry has needed to evolve. Mm -hmm. We don't have physical CDs. Maybe if you're a collector, you still have some physical vinyl. But at the end of the day, really, we want to have the entire library of all recorded music right in our pocket on our mobile device. And so companies like Spotify, and you can buy Spotify, you can own Spotify if you believe in that. Companies like Apple Music, they provide those platforms, uh, Jay-Z's title, provide those platforms so that you actually can um, make your playlist. If you have a running playlist, you have a playlist for romance, you have a playlist for a, a wedding, a party, but you have I, the ability to do it. I wanna know, is streaming better or worse than going through a record label for artists? Well, record companies, they actually are streaming their artists as well, right? Okay. So the bottom line is that whether you're signed to a major or you're releasing independently, mm -hmm. you have the same opportunity to distribute your music globally through the streaming platforms. And there are a number of aggregators. One of my favorites is Steve Stout's uh, United Masters. You don't have to be signed to a major label. The major label is really to have some infrastructure and to have some capital behind your release. But if you've got your own infrastructure and capital, you can literally press two buttons, go to an aggregator, go to a distributor, and literally within one week, your music is available globally. So are you at all afraid of AI AI's disruption in the music industry. It has its pros, but it definitely has its cons. Is it gonna put some people out of business? I believe that technology is already sort of transforming really every single aspect of our lives. Mm -hmm. And I always have approached technology from a place of embracing the technology, understanding the technology, and understanding the ways that human intelligence is differentiated from artificial intelligence. In so doing, obviously we're the ones that came up with AI. In so doing, we can understand how we can remain valuable as the landscape changes. When you look at the headlines, I think I've seen you know, in, in some of the Forbes headlines recently that if you can be a great prompter for ChatGPT, you can be earning six, seven figures per year. And so it is about understanding where the opportunity is. And that opportunity is really in embracing the technology, understanding the technology, mastering the technology so that you can actually benefit from it. And I believe that that goes for any industry that may you know, want to put new and emerging technology at mm -hmm. arm's length. What I found is that great companies that lean into research and development, they find that they're able to accelerate their place in the future of what our economy and what our world is gonna look like. So that sounds like skills-based learning. That's a skill, learning how to do a prompt. Yeah. And I know you're a Harvard man mm -hmm. and you're all about education, mm -hmm. but what do you think the value of a college degree will be in the near future? For me, when I think about my time at Harvard, man, some of the buddies that I, that I have there, my buddy Taj Clayton, my boy Mark Price, uh, my, my brothers Diallo and Bashir, um, you know, folks that I met during Harvard, my other buddy uh, Lex, um, these are all folks or people that I met through uh, colleagues at Harvard. One of my longtime partners, Rasheed Richmond, his mm -hmm. uh, sister was uh, at school with me, his sister of Fra. I believe that being in that ecosystem with high performance critical thinkers is the true value of that college experience. So anyone that you ask, whether they've gone to Cornell or whether they've gone to USC, whether they've gone like my sister at Cal Berkeley, there are relationships that are built there in the formative years of our lives uh, where you find potential business partners, potential collaborators, lifetime and lifelong friends. And I believe that that's really sort of a priceless exchange for the tuition that we pay. Now, mm -hmm. the other reason why I'm never really worried about tuition is because when you can master what we were talking about at the beginning of this uh, conversation, you can take a very small amount of capital and over time, 
compound that capital to cover whatever expenses you may have accrued in student loan debt, et cetera. And I think uh, you know a lot of uh, what I've found is people n necessarily either A, just don't want to learn it, B, they have some, maybe somebody in their family lost some money in the stock market and says, oh, I don't want to touch that at all. <laughs> but what we find is that being uninvested is actually losing you money, right? Because all of the headlines, at least the current headlines, are very, very focused around inflation. The cost of goods and services are going higher. So that means that a dollar today is actually really uh, retains less purchasing power. So you've got to find some way to crack the whip on that money and make it do some somersaults and make it work for you. Otherwise, what you'll find is the same $10 that you wanted to spend uh, on a quick run to you know, one of the bodegas up uptown, that $10 is buying you less and less and less. So that means that you need to make sure that whether it's with our Wealth Plan Club or just on your own or, or with someone that you trust, you have to figure out how to actually make the money that you earn and work so hard for, you have to figure out a way to actually make that money work for you. And that's what we do at Wealth Plan. So other than Wealth Plan, mm -hmm. what's next for Ryan Leslie? Listen, this I think for me has really become a, I think it will be a, a part of my legacy, uh, mm -hmm. what I'm doing at Wealth Plan. Um, it's, uh, it's tremendously rewarding to unlock a financial future that someone may have almost completely overlooked. Mm -hmm. And the way that we work at Wealth Plan is it's very individualized and tailored. So it's one on one, and it's for folks that actually, like me, when I first was seeking out a mentor, they want that personalized attention. They understand it's called personal finance for a reason, and they want to actually have someone to show them the way in a real way, one on one, step by step hand in hand. And so that's what I've been doing. Uh, I'm not a financial advisor. I'm not a stock broker. All I can do is show folks what has made a multi-million dollar difference in the returns in my portfolio. And because of those returns, it gives me the latitude. It gives me the opportunity outside of obviously running my venture backed company, Superphone, right, which is about technology. We can talk about that a little bit more. Um, outside of doing that, it provides a very, very rewarding aspect to my life because what's the use of being wealthy on your own? You want to have folks around you who once, let's say we can turn 100 people into millionaires. Well, that's $100 million of of financial power that we can put behind the initiatives, the uh, change that we want to see in the world. So I believe for me this is a this is a a piece of everything, of everything I'll be doing for the rest of my life is teaching in this way. Um, but on the flip side, um, I've always sort of had this concept of being of service. So when I was in the music business the first jobs that I had, even though I wanted to be the, in front of the cameras, mm -hmm. was to actually be behind the scenes as the producer. And so for me, it was about providing the highest level of service. If somebody needed three song ideas, you give them nine, right? And then uh, once I was able to get in front of the cameras and was starting the tour, I would listen to feedback from audiences, especially when I was overseas, and they say, well, God, you know, uh, artists will come from overseas and they'll get on stage and they, you know, they'll do a backing track and they'll be out of here in 30 minutes. Like, you know, it's, it's God's gift to mankind that they got on a plane to mm -hmm. come over and perform for us. And so for me, in that spirit of service, I spent the extra money to bring the band out and we would play two hour, three hour, in, in some cases, you know, marathon, six hour sets and so people could understand Ryan's about delivering a higher level of service. And so I started to get a lot of folks that would say, hey, Ryan, you know, I want to make it in the music business. And the music business is really sort of tied to, let's say, just a little bit of serendipity. You're not able to just say, if I make a song and I put this much money behind it, it's going to go. If that was the case, everybody would have a hit. Mm -hmm. So the way that I can give back in a way that is objectively valuable is really twofold. Number one, success really happens at the speed of communication. So what we do at Superphone is we put a layer of technology on text messaging and a layer of technology over our phones, mm -hmm. which allows me, currently I'm on text with more than 130,000 people. I've had those conversations, but it's not just about the text, it's also about the ability to layer that on a phone system 
and to do it personally. We've all heard about call centers. You call up Delta Airlines or you mm -hmm. call up somewhere, there's call centers and they're redirecting your call somewhere or you're talking to a robot. My belief and the belief that we have at Superphone and the reason why we have a patent uh, on some of the technology that we're building uh, for automated digital conversation mm -hmm. management is because my belief is that when we can unlock, like if I was to ask you right now, how many contacts do you have in your phone? You might not know offhand. But if I gave you your phone and you scrolled all the way to the bottom and you said, oh, well, I've got 300 contacts, 500 contacts, mm -hmm. 750, 1,000 contacts, the reality is you're likely only engaging with maybe 3% of those contacts, okay. right? Because we like to keep our circle small. Mm -hmm. So what I'm doing at Superphone is my way of being of, ser of service, not subjectively. Because if someone doesn't like my music, then I can't really serve so them. So being Go of ahead. service. Yes. That's what's next. That's, what's, what's, that's, that's what, what you're going to continue doing. That's what doing. drives <laughs> what I'm doing. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining me today, Ryan. Thanks, Rosemary. Appreciate you. Absolutely.